Hello and welcome. Thank you for coming to tonight's program, Poem Jam, curated by, poem, by poet Kim Shuck. While we're waiting for a few more people to join us, I want to take a moment now to acknowledge our community and to tell you about a couple of programs. On behalf of the San Francisco Public Library, we'd like to welcome you to the unceded ancestral homelands of the Ramatush people, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as caretakers of this place. As guests, we who reside in their traditional territory recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush and by affirming their sovereign rights as first peoples. As you probably know, last month was National Poetry Month, and uh, we had a full month of programs. The first one was something called uh, Echoes, Poets in Memoriam, and uh, related to that, we have a uh, book display, a small exhibit on the third floor at the General Collections and Humanities Center reference desk. It'll be up through the end of the month if you wish to see it. That display honors poets who have died in the last three years, about 70 of them and you're free to check out any of the poetry books you see there. Tonight's program is part of a continuing series, Poem Jam, which happens the second Thursday of each month and is curated by Kim Shuck. Uh, next month's program will feature writers associated with Oakland's Beast Crawl Literary Festival. If you're interested in these programs or other library programs, you can check out the flyers on the table over there or the library's newsletter. There's also coffee and cookies and limited editions of the Poem Jam pin for 2023. Or you can also consult the events calendar on our website, sfpl.org. So that ends my announcements. I'm now gonna turn the microphone over to Kim Shuck, who will be introducing tonight's presenters. Please give a warm welcome to Kim Shuck. thought about what I was going to say just now a lot uh, over the last month. Um, and not to put too fine a point on it, I feel like right now in our current political climate, people who are very out and trans are heroic. And that is how that's going to go down in history. Um, so I'm I'm odd to be in the company I'm in tonight, and I really thank you all for being here. Um, it's it's really important work, and uh, I've been saying quite a lot this last probably six months, maybe a little more, that it's my current goal to have my work banned in Florida, <laughs> <laughs> in solidarity. <laughs> um, but I'm just going to get into the show with just one more thing, which is that um, Sinister Wisdom was sort of on my, my list for a long time. I grew up in a San Francisco where there was an old Wives Tales bookstore where a lot of the people who have become the canon of lesbian literature are now, you know, were wandering up and down Valencia Street <laughs> getting, getting herbal tea and petting cats. And, and I'm really pleased at this issue. I, it could have been so different, and it was, it's, I'm really pleased with it. So I'm just delighted that this, is, this show's happening, and I'm going to get out of its way and let it happen. Uh, Christy Lynn Balloony, can you come up? And please welcome. <laughs> My name's Christy. I um, had nothing to do with this issue of Sinister Wisdom. Um, I am a guest editor, though, of an upcoming, um, an upcoming issue in the fall, issue number 130, which will be called We Teach Sex, in parentheses, to everyone. And it's going to be a lot of fun, and I hope to see you all at um, the readings for that later. But um, tonight I'm here to just... Um, read uh, Julie Enzer's uh, introduction and also a short introduction from the editor's 
of this issue, of which there were several. Are, are any of the editors here? No, I think that's why I'm meant to read that. Um, and then um, if you'll indulge me, there's also a, a, a longer essay from Julie that I think give, does the best job of giving some context for uh, the reason that this is, as, as Kim put it, such an important um, issue of sinister wisdom. So I'd like to read just the first paragraph of that um, longer essay and invite you to um, spend some time with it when you have a chance. It is, um, as you said, an amazing issue of Sinister Wisdom. Super proud to be a part of it and to get to uh, meet the authors from it and to congratulate the authors for their work. So this first part is from Julie. Notes for a magazine. I have written before about one project when I became editor and publisher of Sinister Wisdom, determining how to get all the back issues out into the community, into the hands of lesbians who would need them, read them, and use them to dream and imagine new communal possibilities for us all. It was not an easy task, in part because many people suggested that there were limited uses for the ideas and writings of lesbians from the 1980s. I knew these people were wrong, Time is proving that I was correct. A young political science scholar, Elena Gambino, has written a fascinating article analyzing sinister wisdom from the 1980s and tracing the influence of lesbian feminism today. Gambino argues that commonplace antagonism between second wave lesbian feminism and third wave queer theory and politics is both historically and politically reductive. Through her reading of Sinister Wisdom and other sources, she identifies ways that lesbian feminism invested in a reparative politics that offers important resources for feminists and queers dealing with issues of intragroup marginalization. It's a wonderful essay that we'll make available on the Sinister Wisdom website. Gambino's work is part of a new vibrant node of thinking, writing, talking, and engaging with the histories and legacies of lesbian feminism and putting them in dialogue with contemporary thinking, movements, and political, in intellectual, and embodied investments. The issue, this issue of Sinister Wisdom, Sinister Wisdom 128, Trans Feminisms, emanates from these conversations. In the pages of Sinister Wisdom 128, Trans Feminisms, you will find vital thinking about ideas and writings of lesbians from the 1980s, particularly lesbians of color, in relationship to contemporary thinking about trans feminisms. A wonderful team of editors has worked to assemble and curate this material, and I'm thrilled with what they bring to Sinister Wisdom, exploring the intersections of feminisms, lesbianisms, and trans. The multiplicity of thought the capacious engagements and the excitement of different ways of thinking about bodies, lesbianism, and feminism are palpable in each page of the issue. My expectation is that this issue will deliver many thoughtful responses from Sinister Wisdom read readers, and I look forward to them. I'm grateful to everyone in the Sinister Wisdom community for the many ways you help us to thrive. We had a very successful end of year camp fundraising campaign. The response to the sapphic classic of Joan Nessel, A Sturdy Yes of a People, has been extraordinary. If you haven't picked that up, it's so amazing. I have an incredible year of publishing planned with more sapphic classics and a wonderful fall issue exploring how lesbians teach sex and sexuality to ourselves and others. That's us. And thank you to everyone who shows up for Sinister Wisdom and continues to believe in the power, vibrancy, and diversity of lesbian literature, arts, and culture. And this is from the editors uh, uh, as a group. Sinister Wisdom's trans feminisms features writing and artwork by folks across the gender spectrum, including trans, non-binary, gender queer, gender fluid, two-spirit, gender non-conforming, and intersex. We celebrate writers and artists who trouble gender. What perspectives do trans lives bring to the field of feminist thought and practice? What does it mean to hold a conversation about being trans? What does it mean to be a part of that conversation? How do the crossroads of difference affect the conversation? Trans Feminisms is dedicated to exploring and celebrating transness. We include work that appeals to and from transness in a range of mediums, interdisciplinary, genre-bending poetry, fiction, transcribed interviews, manifestos, essays, historical and theoretical deep dives, comic strips, 
visual art, photography, oral histories, speeches, intergenerational conversations, and collaborations. In the spirit of continuing collaboration and conversation, we each have offered our perspectives on why this issue is important and highlighted specific texts that spoke to each of us below. Though we're overjoyed to share them all in this issue, we hope you enjoy trans feminisms and all it brings to expanding the already notable lesbian, queer, and feminist legacy of sinister wisdom, especially under Julie Enzer's impressive editorial leadership. And now one more short paragraph from Julie, and then I'll get out of your way. This is from the opening essay, which I think um, uh, is meant also as an introduction. After sharing with potential contributors the statement on what Sinister Wisdom publishes, I often joke, I do not have time to sleep with all the contributors to the journal, so we rely on women to determine if they see themselves in the pages of Sinister Wisdom. This sly statement about my time harkens back to an imagined past when editors of lesbian feminist journals slept with many, if not all, the contributors to the journals that they published. Honestly, I do not think that there is any historical accuracy in this invention. But for me, the fantasy is fulfilling. This statement also gently asserts my desired refusal to participate in real or imagined policing of lesbian identities, lesbian bodies, and lesbians. I recognize that my intended refusal is only partial. I participate in the communal defining, enforcing, and inscribing of identities, not only through editing and publishing Sinister Wisdom, but as a part of my daily life. These actions of defining lesbian are part of our lives. We cannot opt out completely. Communal identity inscriptions both bring us as lesbians into existence, a wondrous miracle and cause for celebration, and they also limit what is lesbian and what we can imagine for our lives and our worlds. In my refusals, I want to resist limits of lesbian, and I want others to resist them too. Thanks. Honestly, I, I, I'm prone to mischief, and so I'm very tempted to say something about sleeping with everybody you publish. Okay, here's what I'm going to say about that. In the 80s, <laughs> that would have seemed a lot more plausible if, if you'd been part of the Mama Bear's uh, old wives' tales scene. Somebody else is nodding. I'm not out on a limb here. Um, <laughs> And the experience of having like um, upset a girlfriend at some point and then coming home to an intervention. There, the community was tight. Let's just say the community was, community was very tight. I, I also just had a flashback because I, I remembered a thing that's true of me, which is that my first feminine literature that I bought was in an, <laughs> was in an occult bookstore. <laughs> And now you all know which the book that was, right? Um, it's a book about tarot and feminism. Um, and uh, I, I th I'm thinking about what it means to have this particular issue out there in the world and, and young, tr young trans women finding it, you know, and, and finding it in places that aren't... Um, aren't in a cult bookstore. Anyway, uh, I cannot wait to hear from this writer, Kavar. Hi, come on up. Please welcome Kavar to the microphone. Hi, everyone. I'm Kavar. I use they, them pronouns. Um, and before I start, I wanted to give a quick shout out slash dedication of this reading. So today is my mom's birthday. Um, and she has been my most ardent supporter in literally everything that I do. Um, she also ardently refuses categorization in any label sort of whatsoever. Um, but I wanted to make that space for her vibe, her spirit, um, her smile, everything. She's all the way back in Connecticut. Um, I grew up on the East Coast and um, and yeah, it's it's really special to get to share my writing with everyone here. 
Um, and also know that back home, she's cheering me on. So Beth Ann Payne, if you're listening, hi. Okay. Um, so I'm going to read my piece from this issue and it's titled, How to Know If You Are Trans Enough, A 10-Step Plan for Trans Realization. And to contextualize this, I'm going to start with my note. If you're following along at home, it's on page 29 of the magazine. And that note um, just describes a little bit what I mean by trans real. So the note reads, my use of trans real is indebted to artist and scholar Misha Codinas, who in the book, The Trans Real, Political Aesthetics of Crossing Realities, uses the term to, her words, propose aesthetics of crossing the boundaries of realities. Her term might help us think about the multiple fragmented, contradictory, and still simultaneous realities rather than an imagined real that rejects trans contradiction. In becoming trans real, trans bodies make our own worlds, our own times, our own sentences, rewrite, rewriting the possible. Um, we become poems ourselves. All right, so I'm gonna start the piece now. How to know if you are trans enough, a 10 step plan for trans realization. One. Realize cis is an idea, an ideal. No one is born cis, no one is cis enough. Dick pills are for guys who are not cis enough. Boob jobs are for girls who are not cis enough. Cis is everybody's advertisement. 1A, you can either be not cis enough or you can stop trying. Two, realize that no matter if you are trans enough or not, we are all allowed to play. Give yourself permission to play. 2A, permit yourself a useless, weird, unproductive period of gender exploration. It doesn't matter if you end up back where you started. It's the crossing that counts. Three, realize you have the right to a house that is not a cage. 3A, realize that until all have secured this right, your own freedom is worthless. 3B, return to 2A. You may be a useless and weird and unproductive in this house. Four, realize you cannot understand transgender possibilities through a cisgender lens. 4A, understand that no one is fated to be trans or fated to be cis. 4B, understand that no one is destined to be female or male or woman or man. Sex gender is a hostile architecture built to remove us, displace us, place us over here, far from ourselves. Five, realize that those who believe you need permission to be trans are those who view transness as a disease. 5A, reframe yourself pollen, not contagion. Take pleasure in the ensuing sneeze. Six, practice trans ideology. Mockery is another form of fear. Seven, know that nothing will protect you from the violence of sex gender. Sex gender is one word, violent and together. The ultrasound sells mom pink or blue. Why? Seven A, you are already trans enough to kill. 7B, so you are trans enough to live. 7C, so you are trans because you live to tell it. 8, leave space for the unspeakable. Delete this, make more spaces. 9, Stop at nine ways to leave us hanging, or nine A ways. 10, or take the text from the page and make a self from it. 10 A, in other words, make a language. Transition, real to unreal, today to utopia, dream to, light, to live, pejorative to power, 10 B, in other words, rewrite, rewrite your sentence. Thank you.
because I'm a poet. That was one of the pieces that really jumped out at me in the issue. It's hard to translate into English. Language. It really is. I encourage everybody to go look at that piece because the way it's on the way it exists on the page is really particular. Uh, our next reader is Maggie, who is a new person to me, but totally delightful, is all I was going to say. Oh, awesome. Thanks for showing us. All right, what's up, homies? Uh, I'm Maggie. Uh, I use any old pronouns. Um, I always thought poetry readings I always wanted, like, a walkout song, or, like a Born to be Wild, like some Joy Division shit or something. I don't know. But in my head, I'm doing that. Okay, so I wanted to read someone else's poem into my poem because I just felt like a big kinship with uh, Neve Timmons poem and like Neve's first name is my middle name so I was like for life right there you know um, so this is called uh, this is Neve Timmons poem called Camp Trans Press Release August 21st 2006 <clears throat> Michigan against trans women after 15 years of controversy Supporters welcome trans women to the land. The Michigan Women's Music Festival began openly trans women last week, bringing success to a long-standing struggle by trans activists both and the festival. Seeing trans women, the festival, it's restored my faith in women who have already committed the first time next year. Camp Trans. The annual protest across the road from the festival say that every year at least one trans woman at Camp Trans walks to the festival gate with a group of, explains that she is trans. And in past years, the festival has produced a copy of the policy and this time, the response was cash or they said the festival has no policy. Any woman. The woman, her ticket on Wednesday and supporters, the festival. On Friday, to facilitate a schedule workshop discussion, recently retired policy. This discussion has happened before, but for the first time in years, trans women were of the conversation. Inclusion of trans women means for the festival, and now we can move forward. We didn't expect to change anyone's minds the workshop, but in the end, we didn't need to. The we found was overwhelming. Trans women, they say, were moved. And by how friendly and supportive other festival attendees were, inside the festival, talking with other women about how Michigan has grown to embrace the diversity of women's experience. With their original mission accomplished, organizers say Camp Trans will continue to be a place for trans people and allies to build community, share ideas, and develop strategies for change. And they will keep working together with the festival workers and attendees to make sure trans women who the fest next year have and resources. Camp Trans will partner with a group of inside the fest next year to establish an anti-transphobia area within the festival. From camp trans and to educate people on trans issues and provide to trans and differently gendered women, festival attendees have worn pro-trans inclusion solidarity. Both camp trans and at the fest say they are excited to be working together to welcome trans women and a trans-inclusive, women-only space. Communities whole again. The policy divided against each other. Who could be fighting on the same side? We want to be of the healing. The festival's policy, trans women, was first enforced in 1991 when festival security 
from the grounds of the festival. That was the first piece. Um, thank you. Yeah, totally. Um, and I picked that one, obviously, for, you know, sisterhood, whatever, kinship. But, like, the poem I'm about to read is a lot of found text, and that was a found text. It's very, again, again, cool on the page. Good to check out. But this is my poem. Uh, it's to the tune of uh, that Shirley Temple Tong uh, song, uh, Animal Crackers in My Soup. But this is uh, Alphabet Crackers in My Soup. Developed female characters, developed female bodies, developed spells eloped with no V, developed enveloped pussies, the devil is in the detail. Developed female characters, develop tight breasts, develop a strategy to get yourself home. Develop female currencies, develop female bodies, developing children into the currency of images. Develop normalcy. Developed nations and developing ones. Develop female intimacy developer salary 2021. Developer jobs Seattle. Develop web design. Develop pearl thighs. Developed human settlements. Developed female characters. Early childhood development. Early childhood characters. Early childhood bodies. Early and relay use the same letters. Early signs of pregnancy. Early beaches with full-bellied elephant seals. Earl Grey made Bergamot famous. Early movies with Shirley Temple. Early, curly, Shirley Temple hair. The early bird gets the hairless girl. Early looks at filming. Early onset images. Early onset neurodegenerative disorder. Early childhood. Early access. Early childhood access Hollywood. Early childhood development. Early voting absentee ballots. Early elections. Early erections. Because caucus results are coming in early. Caucus word origin. Caucus Washington state. Coming before the erection. Cock and ball torture. Cognitive behavioral therapy. Because cause and effect ended yesterday. Because early warning systems have failed. Because stars are just tips of falling rockets. Because their fission makes no sound. Because caucus results are coming in early. Because cock makes me less of a woman. Because the president-elect coerced developed female bodies. Coerced early childhood bodies. Because Shirley Temple's first two movies were war, ba were war Babies and Baby Burlesque. And that girl played babies until she was 30. And I have never passed the Bechdel test. Because words are just men's meaning coming out of my mouth. And I'm telling you the words women and children use these same letters. All right, thank you, Evan Maggie. So many conversations to be had. AJ, this, is, this person who I've just met was actually trying to come to solutions with me for how I read things and stuff, which is so cool and very supportive, and I really appreciate it. I absolutely love doing these readings, and I've been delighted to meet all of you. AJ, please, welcome AJ to the microphone. Um, hello, I'm AJ. Um, what I'm going to be reading is a few different statements from um, a project I've been working on since 2019. It's started as how I came out to my family as non-binary. Oh, my pronouns are they, them, by the way. Um, yeah, it started as how I came out to my family as non-binary and kind of has continued into this project to kind of help the non-binary community feel understood, validated, and just want everyone to feel like a family. So I have portraits of each person and I have them write a statement on why they identify the way they do. So the first person I'm gonna be reading the statement of is Jem Williams. Jem said, non-binary, one of my favorite words. It speaks to me. My whole life, I've never been able to fit into any boxes. Being mixed race, gay, and uncomfortable, and unconforming made sure of that. Coming across the word non-binary felt like, like coming home. 
Being neither this or that is a familiar feeling. Breaking apart social conventions is my life goal, and here's another tool I can use to do it. Non-binary isn't just about not being entirely a girl or a boy. It's about fighting against a society that wants to stomp me out. Non-binary means fighting against white supremacy, the evil that enforced our society's ideas of gender in order to erase other cultures. It means fighting against cis-heteropatriarchy, the system that controls how we relate to others and ourselves, forcing us to build barriers around others and ourselves. It's about fighting capitalism, the system that diminishes our worth. Non-binary is love and acceptance, warmth to heal us from a cold society. Non-binary means I get to be unapologetically me. The next statement I'll be reading is by my friend Finn Grace Lee. Being non-binary for me personally means being exactly as I am, honoring all parts of myself, even the confusing and painful parts, while also the joyful parts. The next statement will be for, by my fr another friend. All of them are friends and family. Um, this next person is Alex Rodriguez. What does it mean to be non-binary? For me, it means being on a spectrum. It means allowing myself to think about my personality and expression in a bigger sense than masculine and feminine. The possibilities for how I feel about myself feel endless when I don't associate my gender identity to a binary label. Until people stop assuming what a man or a woman looks like or should act like, there is always expectations projected on the binary. I feel like I can't fit into that space, so identifying being non-binary helps me remind myself that all I need to think, worry about is myself and love for myself. This next statement is another friend slash family, is Roy Cedric Raguda. To me, non-binary can be as simple as deciding to live one's life as free and true oneself as possible. I am me gender. I am simply myself, despite any parts I may have been born with. Who, are, who we are is often affected by how society views us, but how we identify ourselves is entirely about how we view ourselves. We exist outside the strict definitions, and that is powerful and also vulnerable, which is why I admire non-binary individuals because they are able to live their lives honestly. And living openly as non-binary is a statement made to society that says we can be more than what we were told to be. And when I came out, I included myself in the series just so I didn't have to talk to my parents about this. So I made them read it. Um, so what is non-binary? What does the word mean to you? Why do you identify this way? These are questions I've been asking everyone I've met with. I've been thinking about what that means to me. Why do I identify this way? What is non-binary? I grew up questioning everything, including why girls could only do some things, boys others. I never felt like I fell into either category of girl or boy, male or female, man or woman. But I didn't want to have to change in order to fit into these categories. I felt insecure as a female, but I didn't slash don't want to be male. I never felt girly enough to be female, but also never a tomboy. I was introduced to the word non-binary as a freshman in college. I won't lie, I was one of the people who thought it was weird, but after a while, I realized that these people didn't have to worry about fitting into these categories. Yes, this is way more than fitting into categories, but it's a push against social standards that says you cannot tell me who to be. It took me a year of thinking to fully realize I wanted that mental freedom. I don't want to fit into these categories. I want to be me. Since identifying this way and changing my name, using they, them pronouns, and allowing myself to do things I wouldn't when identifying as a female, such as buying male clothing, I felt more free. I've been happier. So what is non-binary? Non-binary is happiness. Non-binary is freedom. And yeah. Thank you so much. 
Our next reader is Natasha Dennerstein, who um, has been a friend of mine for a number of years now. And uh, I'm going to share something that I shared with her a little earlier, which is that at one point I was interviewed and, and somebody asked me if there was any poet that I, uh, that I thought maybe I, I booked too often. I was like, no, but I feel like I could book Natasha every month and be completely content to hear her read once a month. <laughs> Please welcome to my microphone, Natasha Dennerstein. Thank you. <clears throat> Blackberry. Blackberry is a fierce, resilient plant and can survive harsh weather conditions. If you ever try to rip it out, you can't. Eradication, a hopeless mission. The blackberry is like my <clears throat> favorite sister. She is tough with a delicate flower. And her sweet, sweet skin is fine, yes, mister. Her fragrant hair, a cascade of power. Her arms are strong, her legs are long and lean, and she rumbers through all sorts of trouble. The female she is and the male she's been only serve to protect her the double. She strides in her heels all over this town, and like the blackberry, she cannot be burned down. Yeah. <clears throat> That's for my trans girls, of which I am one. Um, here's a new poem. <clears throat> it's called 13 Ways of Looking at a Homeless Woman. One, a pile of rags. Then suddenly the pile of rags moves. The moving pile of rags is a person, you. Two, in your pockets are rotting fish heads and carcasses. A rotting smell is the surest way to avoid rape. The scraps are discarded in a skip in back of the fishmongers. A stinking woman wants to be left alone. Three. Underneath the freeway, the car noise is regular and rhythmical and provides a soundtrack that is curiously comforting. Kathunk, kathunk, kathunk. Like a metronome at practice at the bar. Four. The Salvation Army give out sandwiches. Sometimes it's bologna and cheese, and sometimes it's turkey. Christianity with its sleeves rolled up. Five. Many years of intense ballet tra training equipped you to physically deal with the sequelae of sleeping on concrete. Six. Adderall, trademark, for focus and weight loss. Roxycodone, trademark, for injuries, soft tissue and bone. When the ballet training stopped, the pills didn't. Seven, those apartments on Valencia Street were great for 25 years until you couldn't get up the three flights of stairs, no elevator. Eight, when all your belongings fit into a shopping cart, you have to be selective about what you keep and what you discard. Nine, shame and embarrassment are a luxury for those that can afford to have them. Ten, there is a musicality to everything, even traffic. Everything ebbs and flows in movements with repetitive themes. Eleven, in the dawn hour, birds are active in the city. So are rats. Twelve, in the city, people are discarded if they don't contribute economically. It's called capitalism. 
13. The urge to survive is remarkable. It's one of the fundamental laws of nature. <clears throat> Here's a poem from this book. Um, this is about Eileen Warnos. It's called Broken, A Life of Eileen Warnos in 33 Poems. Um, came out during the pandemic. Um, Stick Up, Edgewater, Florida. Drunk as a skunk when I entered the store. Don't even know why I did it. $35 from the Mini Mart and two packs of Newports, allegedly. They carted me off and stuck me in jail with a rough little group of ladies. Years on the streets had taught me the skills to survive and I kept to myself, allegedly. O oh, Tyra, we met at a gay bar in Daytona Beach. I liked it there. You can drink and dance without the guys hitting on you. You stared at me from the bar and I saw you recognize another sad little girl with no friends, just like me. There was something broken in you, Tyra, just like the something that was broken in me. We hooked up and holed out in a motel room, luxuriating for days in our shared loneliness, now halved. I had found my kindred spirit, my trouble and strife. You were my ride or die, Tyra, my ride or die for life. Couple more. Florida Love Song. That it also comes from this book. Florida Love Song. Oh, Florida. How I fell in love with you, bitch, from the minute I entered through your Alabama border on the bench seat of a skylark with the radio on. How I thought I'd arrived in heaven with your tropical flamingo sunsets and your key lime pies. How I explored you from up in Jacksonville all the way down to Coral Gables, your Cuban cigars, your biker bars. How I could wear Daisy Dukes and a tank top all day, every day, Florida, from your balmy mornings to your sultry nights in your motels, mansions and trailer parks, from Tallahassee to Miami Beach and your Florida Reef Beach. Oh, your orange blossoms, your alligators, your easygoing ways, your pawn shops and liquor stores from Tampa Bay to the Everglades. I fucking loved you and vowed I would never, ever leave you till my dying day. <clears throat> Last one is called Passing... At I, I, I want, I'm Australian, I want to say passing, but I say passing because I think no, people will say, I beg your pardon. People don't understand me, but I'll say it like naturally, I want to say passing, passing, not passing. <laughs> Pretend American, I'm a faux American, I'm transitioning into being American. <laughs> passing as human, passing this way, passing real. I'm passing as a woman, I'm passing as white, passing as a person. I don't really know what I am, but I go through the motions of what I think I'm supposed to do to not get asked to leave. If everybody feels they don't belong, doesn't that mean that everyone belongs? Thank you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. I think that was an amazing reading. And um, what I do know is that these get watched a lot after the event itself. I think a lot of folks are still anxious about being out at big events. And so I encourage you to share 
with your friends. When the link comes out, I'll send it to the people who read. Give yourselves a hand, the readers, the audience. Our cameraman, thank you so much. John Smalley, who is my cohort in this endeavor every month. Um, and what I want to say is, if you're comfortable with it, people who read, Doug takes a photo every, Doug, put your hand up, please. Doug takes a photo uh, for every one of these events. And it's OK if you don't want to participate, but we'd love to have a record of just the incredible, beautiful diversity that that we've had. So we have pictures from almost all of these events across the, I guess it's been, what do, how long? <sighs> now I'm tired. <laughs> anyway, thank you all. And uh, readers, if you're up for it, please assemble by the mural. Thank you. <laughs>